Hello everyone, we are back with Let's Remember Suicoden 3. We last saw um, the Caria incident from Chris's viewpoint and uh, didn't go well. Um, lots of people needlessly murdered. Chris killed Lulu. Uh, she killed a kid. Um, we will end up seeing that again from Hugo's point of view, but... Uh, for now, Chris just has to report back to the council. This will probably be a short last segment. Uh, this sort of just exists to reinforce um, the politics of Zexin once again and how Chris is sort of ensnared in in that web a little bit. Um, an interesting space for her to be in. Again, I always call attention to religion in games, um, even though the religion of what is going on um, or, or, or our understanding of what Zexin's religion is is very vague. There's a goddess. They they believe in the Zexin rune. Um, there's not real context for what that all means. Um, but it helps things feel real. And, you know, she's in this place. She's in a church, which is a place we might associate with penance. And she um, she can't help think about what has happened. She doesn't understand the anger that that she encountered um, because she had not participated in slaughter the way that Boris apparently has. Um, and she has questions about you know, how dedicated she needs to be in order to serve Zexin. Um, You know, she knew that she would face animosity, she says, when she chose the life of a knight. But I, I, this is a moment where she experience a hatred, experiences a hatred that she does not, um, that re like, it just really, it really hits her. Um, and that's human and relatable. And that's one of the reasons I really like Chris, is that you can feel the burden that she has placed on herself and that other people have placed upon her and how it affects her. Um, and yet she sort of perseveres and presses forward in a way that is um, understandable and human and still sort of admirable in, in how she handles it. Um, it makes her relatable. We understand that there's a confluence of systems that are affecting her, uh, her sort of thoughts, and then also just pure emotional um, doubts that she has. And, you know, she asks, you know, am I dedicated? Do you believe in me? And he says, I know of no one more dedicated, uh, no no more dedicated sex in than you. Um, but but she cannot help but, but deal with these doubts. Um Right, she seeks whatever degree of solace that she can find in in affirmation from another person because she has uh, that much doubt, um, and she's uncomfortable with with this political decision too, um, really military decision to move the army into the grasslands. Um, it's further exacerbation of something that has happened. Um, you know, what was the point? We we were. Uh, There was a ceasefire. Um, why were the Zexin knights uh, brought to battle? And you know, it's it's the enemy who first breached the agreement, was it not? Um, and and they they just sort of use this incident in order to play into whatever power grab they want. Their their excuse to push people forward out of their land to attack the Grasslanders. Um, there's enough. Um, there's enough here for them to find justification in their further machinations. Um, right, and they say, you know, I heard you burnt down that village. It's quite an accomplishment. And she says, you know, didn't have a choice. Um, had to be done. But she's not comfortable with uh, with what has happened. But they are saying, you know, 
it will increase your reputation. This will be here, you know, people from other nations will hear of this. And, um, you know, she doesn't want glory, she says. Um, she just wanted to rescue the people under her command. Um, she says it was not an act of bravery. She cannot comprehend the notion that these sort of really, I mean, these, these people are political snakes. She, and she, she cannot comprehend the way that they are approaching um, this incident, right? It, they are so detached from the reality of what occurred um, that there's this huge disconnect between what she understands and then what is going on. If the council wishes to invade another land, do so with your own combat teams. She doesn't want part of this. But she's, she's forced, you know, she, she has this sort of oath of fealty to the council. But she has this moral dilemma where she doesn't want to take part in what's occurring. Um, right? It's, she is torn between the, again, the political systems that dictate that she behave one way. And then her personal moral compass that demands that she, that she behave another way and, and sort of make penance. For, for what she has done and they, they again invoke the goddess and we can see that, you know who are these hypocrites let us pray to our goddess who is basically just this thing they invoke to feel righteous about themselves even though even though they are plotting further war um we can see these people for the hypocrites that they are um that might be the end of the chapter? No, we have a little bit more. Um, but uh, absolutely, Chris's chapter has a lot going on in it. It's not that Ghetto's chapter does not, it's just that Ghetto's larger relevance to the plot is not really understood until we play a little longer and, and learn a little bit more about him. For now, he's sort of this enigma eding, enigmatic, excuse me, uh, figure. Um, uh, but here, th there's a lot more for us to sort of openly digest. And Boris... Like, th like, here's another strange thing, right? Boris is like, let me walk you home. Um, like, there are still these little moments where chivalry pops its head up, even though, by all rights, she is, you know, she is his superior. She she can walk around the corner to, to her house. And obviously, he's sort of extending this out of um, a desire to emotionally support his captain, but it also, there's this way in which... Boris and some of the other people treat Chris, particularly in this chapter, that um, they coddle her. They don't necessarily treat her as, you know, as capable as she is. Um, and, you know, she expresses gratitude for their concern, but um, we know that Chris is capable. Um, but still, the other people in the space do not always treat her as capable as we know that she is. And we actually get to see her in private, um, you know? This is where she's sort of able to be a little bit more herself, um, even though there is a dynamic going on here between her and her butler, right? But she can she's a little bit more open when she when she's uh in private. And that is the end of Chris's chapter. Um a lot of interesting stuff for us to discuss. Um heading forward, uh that's not the way I want to go. We will head I think I got it right, to Hugo, Hugo's chapter, uh, where we will see the Caria incident from his perspective. 
um, which will be a, a little more emotional. Um, but thank you for watching. Uh, I, I'm really enjoying the chance to play this game. As I keep on saying, if you are enjoying this, please let me know. Um, I want to make sure that I'm providing content that you find worthwhile or interesting. Um, it's it's my hope always to provide content that um, encourages me to think about games critically, encourages you to think about games and, and stories critically, and also entertains. Um, and I, I hope I'm doing that. So thank you for watching. I, I love you very much. And I will see you in the uh, in, in Hugo's chapter. So uh, thank you. Bye.